Good morning and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Green Deal Net Project, the European Green Deal, governing the EU transition towards climate neutrality and sustainability. This is a Jean Monnet network funded through the EU Erasmus Plus program. I'm Professor Annalisa Savaresi from the University of Eastern Finland. I'm one of the proud members of this network. And today we are here to address the specific theme of the sustainability transition of the EU food systems making progress or taking time. The European Green Deal uh, it was intended to accelerate the transition towards sustainable food systems, making them fair, healthy and environmentally friendly. Yet very little of this ambition seems to have been realized. As we embark on the second term of the von der Leyen Commission, this roundtable will reflect on the EU's agri-food policies and how they have contributed to making EU food systems more sustainable. We will identify what is missing and explore major bottlenecks that we can expect in trying to reach a genuine transition. Our expert panel today will exchange views on existing instruments and necessary reforms of key instruments such as the common agricultural policy. So we're very lucky to have a set of excellent speakers today to deal with this complex subject matter. I will introduce them in turn now. Um, first, we will hear from Gaëlle Marion. Uh, she's head of unit of, for environmental sustainability and the director general for agriculture and rural development of the European Commission. Then we'll hear from Alan Matthews, professor emeritus of European agricultural policy, University of Dublin Trinity College. Um, to follow, Julia Riedo is sustainable farming policy officer at WWF. Um, Finally, we have two uh, speakers from um, different perspectives, one from academia and the other one from, um, if you like, the grassroots level. We have Roberto Talenti, who is Doctor of Researchers in Agro-Environmental Law at Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, Italy. And finally, Vitor Rodriguez, who is a board member of the Portuguese National Confederation of Agriculture, as well as uh, um, European Coordination of the Via Campesina. You can find the more detailed bio of all our speakers on the event web page. For now, I would like to give the floor to each of our speakers to give some opening remarks on the theme of today's conversation. I will start with Gail. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to, to be with you today. So for my for my opening remarks i think i will um, i will challenge perhaps a little bit the, what you said that not much has been done our our impression uh, for the last five years is rather than than quite a lot has been done and we can see what can be still uh, done better and and what more remains to be done but quite a lot has been done in the last five years starting indeed with the Green Deal, which gave a lot of uh, impetus in several important domains, uh, setting, for example, the objective to be uh, for the EU to be climate neutral by 2050, and um, but also to restore ecosystems uh, which are in need of restoration uh, by 2050, to have healthy soils by 2050, and to have 25% of organic uh, uh, of, of farmland, sorry, farmed as organic by 2030 even. So there, there were this lot of, of objectives that were set and many of them followed with, with actions. Um, as far as public policies are concerned, and of course I will start by the common agricultural policy because this is on, on, on the domain in which I work, um, we had in the CAP reform, although it was prepared before the Green Deal, but it was adjusted and it was already very much with a, a, a bigger environmental and climate uh, um, uh, ambition. There were more stringent conditions linked to CAP support in general, so including income support. This is what we call conditionality. The rules were very much strengthened. And this is what caused, by the way, this year some, some tensions and where we had to make a few adjustments. This, uh, this conditionality still remains more ambitious than in the previous um, common agricultural policy. And we have more funding 
to be dedicated to environmental and climate measures and objectives. Um, in what member states have planned in their CAP strategic plans, 32% of the funding is planned for environment, climate and animal welfare objectives. And these for action that go beyond this conditionality that I mentioned, so for things that are more ambitious. Um, there are good practices that I finance for uh, grassland protection, for soil protection, uh, green cover, no reduction of, uh, reduction of chemicals, for um, uh, biodiversity practices like uh, flower strips uh, along uh, fields, uh, for uh, setting uh, landscape features, there are actions for water protection, there are investments as well, and notably in relation to water, for more efficient use of water, so more efficient irrigation infrastructure, or uh, precision farming, or water reuse infrastructure, which is even better as well as nature-based solutions. There are investments for manure management, uh, for, for several things. These are just examples. So I would say on, this, on the part of the CAP, there's already a, a, a very good framework in place. Now we'll have to see with the implementation what still remains to be done and, and what are the challenges that remain. Other policies came in as well, which are important for the food system, so it's not just a cap. So there's the nature restoration law, which will come with um, the, the need to restore agricultural ecosystems, make more space for nature, re-wet peatlands. These are very demanding uh, uh, requirements that are important for the environment. There is the proposal for a soil monitoring law, uh, so this is still in, in discussion and um, and, and with the other institutions, it's not yet adopted, but it's on good track. The green claims uh, regulation was also adopted, directive, sorry, was also adopted. This will also be very important for all food products that can only claim um, environment or climate value if this is demonstrated. So that will steer really the, the, the real quality of, of products when they have a good impact on environment uh, or climate and no other claim can be made. There have been the packaging and packaging waste regulation as well, also uh, affecting, of course, food products uh, and, and uh, agricultural products uh, when they are sold directly. There have been a revision of the industrial emission directive with now covering more farms, uh, uh, pig and poultry farms. There's the carbon certificate um, also regulation that will uh, help steer the storage of carbon in soils and in land in general. So all this uh, will build up, will help build uh, more sustainable food systems. The food law, you may say, was not adopted, was not proposed. This is true, but all these other elements really matter. And as you see, at the farm level, at the uh, packaging level, at uh, the level of, uh, of labeling uh, with the green claims. So already uh, uh, quite a lot of things are in place. I would add uh, one minute um, that the private sector was also um, steered by the, uh, the launch of the Green Deal and all these, these uh, objectives. We know of numerous private initiatives to reduce emissions and store more carbon. And we know of, of a lot of initiatives for regenerative farming, for improving soils, notably. But that's just examples. Research and innovation has also and is continuing to play an important role in all that. And a lot of projects concern the sustainability of food systems. Now, when we will come, I suppose, later in the discussion, it's true that there are things we still don't see, that uh, we, we can't monitor, we don't see yet the results, we don't have all the data to see all the progress made with all these uh, new laws and new initiatives. So this is something um, that we see, we, we, we have some gaps in data. And I can already say that in the, um, with the coming commission, we have already plans for more actions, a vision for agriculture, um, a reform of the common agriculture policy, uh, an important initiative of, on water resilience, a strategy on climate adaptation, a new climate law for 2040. There's an evaluation of the nitrate directive going on, etc. So also a lot more to come. So I hope with this I've given in a short time a, a good uh, overview. Thank you. I'm happy to hear others, of course. Many thanks, Gail. It's very helpful to have this excellent overview to start our conversation today. Alan, you're next. What are your initial thoughts for us? 
thanks very much, Annalisa. And uh, I'm also going to focus a little bit on that uh, first stage of the food chain, so the agricultural uh, sector, as that's, uh, I suppose, my main interest. And hopefully uh, other speakers will cover uh, the, the, the food end of it, uh, which is, of course, equally important in this discussion on sustainability. Um, I, I suppose we start uh, by simply uh, noting that, uh, particularly on the environmental dimension of sustainability, you know, we are in deep trouble. And Although there are some indicators uh, which are showing some signs of improvement, um, for example, on, on, on nitrogen uh, use, uh, but many of the indicators uh, that we look at are still showing uh, we're going in the wrong direction. Just earlier this week, uh, the European Environment Agency uh, released its uh, report on, on Europe's state of waters 2024. Okay, the data only go up to uh, 2021. Uh, but uh, again, they're demonstrating that despite the fact that we've had the water framework regulation in place since the 1990s, uh, we are still uh, uh, not making uh, progress there. And we also have similar uh, evidence, uh, for example, on, on some of the biodiversity indicators, um, some of the soil health indicators, and, and of course, on greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, there is a real issue, and um, this was to be addressed then in the Green Deal, uh, which had two uh, legs, if you like. You had the industrial um, uh, and uh, energy decarbonization uh, side, and then you had the, uh, the, the, uh, the nature and food uh, side, which was, of course, uh, reflected in the Farm to Fork and the Biodiversity Strategies published in, in, in May 2020. And I suppose one first observation is that uh, we have seen remarkable progress, uh, I think, uh, both on the legislative front, but also indeed on, on the performance indicators in terms of industrial uh, and energy decarbonization. The Commission uh, succeeded in getting nearly all of its legislative uh, program uh, through uh, in that uh, part of the Green Deal. There's still some discussion about the date for phasing out internal combustion engines, for example, but um, uh, we, 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 we got the European climate law, the rest of the European uh, climate architecture updated and, and so on. Uh, I would say that, yes, uh, there has certainly been um, uh, movements on the, uh, the farm to fork side of things. Remember that this was a vision paper initially. Uh, when it was published, it was actually uh, welcomed by both the European Parliament uh, and the uh, and the Council um, uh, of, of, of Agricultural Ministers. Um, there was indeed some grumbling at the time that uh, it hadn't been accompanied by an impact assessment. This wouldn't normally be the case, I guess, for a, for a white paper. And uh, most of the legislative initiatives <coughs> that subsequently uh, came, of course, were uh, accompanied by an impact assessment. Um, Gail has uh, uh, very thoroughly outlined uh, some of the changes that were introduced over the last political uh, cycle. Um, I, I guess as it's maybe a, at last half full, uh, half empty picture, uh, because of course, as many of those proposals were going through uh, the co-legislator, they were weakened uh, somewhat compared to the uh, Commission's uh, original um, uh, a proposal. We see this, for example, in the um, in the industrial industrial emissions and livestock rearing uh, um, directive revision there, um, where uh, indeed there has been some change in terms of the coverage of some of the larger uh, livestock uh, uh, enterprises. But uh, the commission's ambition had been much much greater than what uh, emerged subsequently. Um, we also do see quite a number of the pieces of legislation that had been uh, indicated in the farm to fork and, and, and uh, strategy, um, not seeing the, the 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 light of day. Obviously, uh, the, the the most well known one is uh, well, the, the sustainable use of pesticides directive. Of course, was. Uh, put forward, but was rejected in the European Parliament and then subsequently withdrawn. Um, the Integrated Nutrient uh, Action Management Plan, which was promised, uh, it didn't see the light of day as yet. Um, various pieces of animal welfare legislation um, also didn't see the light of day, and 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 obviously also the sustainable uh, the, the framework on sustainable food systems. So. 
Uh, this, I guess, reflected the fact that um, uh, although there was an initial, an initial welcome um, uh, from the political groups uh, for the, the vision in, in the Farm to Fork strategy, uh, when the rubber hit the road, um, uh, there were, there, there were uh, serious reservations raised. Now that's on the legislative side. Um, Gail also quite rightly uh, highlighted the uh, the importance of the the, the change in the uh, the cap regulations um, uh, um, initiated in in 2018 and agreed then in in, in 2021 um, and and introduced from uh, the 1st of January uh, uh, 2023. And I do agree that both the intent and the um, uh, the outcome of that reform was a, a higher level of environmental ambition. Uh, and we see this uh, both in terms of the way in which the greening elements in the previous uh, cap uh, were integrated into conditionality and somewhat strengthened uh, in, the, in the most recent reform uh, and in the greater uh, allocation of resources um, uh, uh, within the, 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 the cap pillar one and pillar two, uh, two to environmental action. Of course, there has been, I think, some disappointment that member states haven't necessarily used the, the flexibility that they have been given under the new delivery model to actually um, use uh, those opportunities to really drive forward, particularly on the environmental uh, side. Um, uh, we don't have as yet a, a good overview uh, and evaluation of the eco schemes that were introduced, um, but there is, uh, I think, a strong suspicion, at least, uh, that many of these don't have a lot of additionality. Uh, they're paying farmers for, for, for practices that per perhaps were already in place. Um, um, uh, so, uh, you know, the jury is a little bit out on, 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 on that side of things. And then, of course, we did see uh, this wave of uh, farm protests uh, starting towards the end of 2023 and continuing into spring of this year. Um, the origin of these protests was very varied, uh, depending on country. Uh, in some cases, it was uh, like in Germany, uh, um, uh, uh, opposition to increases in domestic uh, fuel uh, 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 prices. Uh, in other cases, like the Netherlands, it was uh, their longstanding um, uh, nitrogen issue. But it did coalesce around a series of uh, issues, uh, concerns over farm incomes, um, uh, the so-called the, the administrative burden of the environmental regulations, and and opposition uh, to 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 trade agreements, um, and that led subsequently to uh, a walking back of some of the uh, uh, changes that had been made uh, in the cap uh, reform, particularly around conditionality. Um, uh, and I suppose the, the the one that's most striking is perhaps the uh, the, the, the the total elimination of any uh, obligation on arable farmers uh, to to maintain uh, uh, land in in sort of non productive areas, either lying fallow or or, or, or with landscape features. Um, uh, okay, there is. Um, uh, an obligation now on member states to to actually provide financial incentives through eco schemes uh, to try to achieve uh, the same biodiversity benefits that were hoped for, for from that. Uh, and again, it remains to be seen uh, how, how that will be implemented. And I, I think we'll come back to this point when we come to discuss maybe about future uh, policy, whether that's, if you like, a signal as to what the likely strategy under the new uh, commission and the new political cycle is going to be. Thanks, Annalisa. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive overview on the missed opportunities, perhaps, that we have seen in the recent past. Julia, now the floor is yours for your reflections to get us started. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I will focus maybe more on, on the food side since Alan covered very well the part on agriculture and, and production side. Um, so, yes, according to us, um, the, the, the starting of the previous mandate of Wadden Lion was quite promising uh, with the farm to forest strategy. We, we were really supportive of um, the systemic approach that the farm to fork was, uh, was taking because it, uh, it was quite new to see um, a vision and a strategy from the European Commission going from agriculture to, to the demand side. 
and we we saw a bit uh, this initial intention really fading towards the the end and when the pre-electoral debate started. Um, although I want to recall two major successes, um, probably during the the von der Leyen uh, Commission, the previous uh, mandate. One is the um, regulation on the deforestation um, on the deforestation. I think it's uh, it's a very important um, uh, it's a very important law to uh, uh, that that help also uh, to increase the sustainability of the global food system and not only in, in Europe um, because it's um, uh, it reminds how actually Europe uh, has a big impact on also on third countries and I think it's uh, it's very important to uh, highlight the importance to, um, of uh, of this regulation to um, to bring um, uh, to to increase the level of environmental sustainability not only in Europe but also in third countries and then of course the nature restoration law even if the part on agriculture was almost uh, killed at the end of the, of the mandate. So very few elements remain in it that are related to, to agriculture. Um, it was mentioned by, um, by uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the part on uh, rewetting peatlands. Uh, and wetlands, um, but on for on farm restoration, the the part is very is very limited. Um, then I think in terms of shortcomings, I can of course um, mentioning the the lack of the publication of uh, of the framework on the sustainable food system, which we think it's um, it's a very missed opportunity, um, very big missed opportunities because uh, what is lacking now in the policy mix is, is actually uh, an overarching law that set a direction for the whole sector. I think it's um, it, it will be very important to have it in this mandate because uh, for now the um, the sector. Um, seems to not have a clear direction towards the sustainability. Yes, we have some targets that were decided at the beginning of the previous mandate, but I think um, those targets remain asp aspirational targets and they are not uh, written in law like it was, for example, for the climate law. And uh, we need um, something very similar, uh, similar to steer the direction for the sector and also to better direct investment from, from the private sector. So I think that an overarching a framework law and an overarching, uh, overarching law that cover, um, from, uh, uh, that cover the sector from the production to, to the demand, to, to, to consumption, is something that is really needed. And uh, the other shortcoming is a proposal that uh, would help to drive the food demand to a um, higher level of sustainability so that um, can help consumers to, uh, to choose a sustainable and, and, and healthy food. Um, there was some um, some elements were meant to be in the sustainable food system framework law. Um, there was discussion around labeling and discussion uh, around um, how to increase the sustainability, for example, of food, uh, public procurement, but none of these so so the light. So I think it's a real pity because there's already um, uh, quite a good amount of work that has been done by the Commission, and I think it will be really a pity to leave it there where, where it stands. And I think, for example, in terms of food, I understand that the Commission has, for example, a limited um, uh, um, uh, a limited capacity to to act, uh, limited competence on that. But for example, there are some leverages like the public procurement that uh, could really bring um, a, a, a good push toward um, toward more sustainable consumption and to make the um, uh, sustainable and healthy food, the easiest choice. Um, for example, by exposing children and their parents also to, to healthy food, but not only children, because if we are not speaking only um, about school, but also uh, other um, pub um, public uh, canteen, for example, in, in the institutions. Um, or in uh, hospitals or everything that is related uh, to the public sector. 
Um, yes, and I think uh, those are for me the, the two main shortcomings and um, I really wish that in the vision we'll, <laughs> we'll have something related to, uh, to demand. Also, because if we are looking, for example, the need for decarbonizing um, the, the agricultural sector, uh, driving the demand and the consumption is very important also to avoid offsetting. So if we want to decarbonize uh, the, um, the agricultural sector and we don't want just an increase of import products, we really need to try to change diet as well within the European Union. Yes, and I think I can finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. You're raising very important questions there and difficult ones too. Roberto, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I took notes while the other speaker was indeed speaking, so I will try to avoid being too redundant. And I will start by, uh, indeed, like what Gabriel Manon said, like the fact that the first von der Leyen Commission indeed did something unprecedented in terms of trying to mainstream the sustainability issue all across the European legislative and policy frameworks. And I mean, I totally agree uh, on this, of course, um, even though here maybe it would be interesting to make a caveat and try to understand what do we really mean when we talk about sustainability, because oh, as a term, sustainability is really used and misused sometimes, but I don't want to open now the Pandora box. I just think that I mean, it's quite evident that also with the launch in uh, May 2020 of the Front to First strategy, the European Commission is really acknowledging the fact that it is necessary indeed to have this transition of European food systems. And this is good, for sure. Uh, but then, like I would say, like in order to understand to what extent so European food systems have become more sustainable, it would be interesting to see to what extent also the Front to First strategy has been implemented, right? Like, like after four years and a half now. Of course, it would be difficult to have a kind of uh, comprehensive assessment of this now, but for sure, like we know that many new legal instruments have been produced over the last five years, which deeply affect European food systems. And I'm thinking about the new common agricultural policy, of course, but also many, many other instruments uh, from the effort sharing regulation to the Lucia regulation, the deforestation regulation, the nature restoration law, like you name it, like we have many. Um, I would say, like, commenting on these uh, first bunch of instruments, like, for sure, they have a very strong environmental component. My personal concern as a researcher, I would say, is that they are, in my view, and I can argue, like, uh, I can give reason for this, uh, they're not strong enough. I mean, we have these new legal instruments, we have new, completely new instruments, we have some amended uh, instruments, especially under the Fit for 55, we have the amendment of many, many, new many, many old provisions. But they are not enough. And actually, it's not just me saying this. Actually, just a few, if I'm not wrong, two weeks ago, the European Court of Auditors published a report on uh, indeed the new common agricultural policy and on CAP strategic plans. And actually, it's already clear in the title of the report, this new CAP is somehow greener, the Court of Auditors says, but not enough. And I would say not enough is not something we can afford where, when we're talking about the environmental, climate, biodiversity crisis. Um, and actually, something really similar has been said a few months ago uh, already by the European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change. So in January, the report towards uh, climate neutrality, I don't remember precisely the title, but in January, this body of experts, basically, uh, European body of experts, basically said that the European Union is not on track to achieving the 2030 and 2050 climate targets. So the von der Leyen Commission, the Green Deal Commission, which established, like identified these targets and also enshrined them in the European climate law, has not been able to put the EU on track towards their achievement. And actually the scientific, I mean, the advisory board on climate change was saying that we should do more in any sector, in particular on the LULUCF sector and also in the agricultural sector. And they were pointing at the fact, at, at the fact that the new common agricultural policy, again, is not strong enough on this respect. Then it would be interesting also to look not just at the legal instruments which have been produced, over the last five years, but also at those which have not been produced. But here, I don't want to be repetitive and say what Alan already said. But if you read, as you know, if you read the Farm to Fork strategy uh, of May 2020, like you can see the really central role 
which in the framework of this communication was given to indeed the uh, legislative framework for sustainable food system, the sustainability labeling framework, the sustainable use directive. And the fact that these legal instruments have not been produced, I would say, makes really hard to say that the von der Leyen Commission, the first von der Leyen Commission, was really able to implement the farm to fork strategy. So this would be my first comment on this. Then a second level of uh, analysis, but I don't want to take too much time, actually would be trying to understand to what extent even a full implementation of the farm to fork strategy would have been enough to make European food system sustainable. Okay, Because I would say that there are some really interesting contradictions, both within the farm to fork strategy and within the European Green Deal, that I would be very happy then to, to uh, better discuss over this, this round table, of course. But I mean, one of the many things uh, that could be said in this regard, like re uh, relates to an article which has been published a few months ago in Nature, Sustainability. It's a really important journal uh, by Zong and uh, other scholars. And basically, this article was saying that a full implementation of the farm to fork strategy and of the European Green Deal, while having positive environmental impact on the European territory, would have really significant spillover effects which would actually, according to this, I mean, I didn't make this study, but according to this study, this um, like negative uh, outsourcing basically would definitely uh, go beyond the positive environmental impact that we have inland. They were talking about something like 23.9 million hectares of land that the European Union will require now, like from outside the European borders in order to satisfy its needs. And just to, like in a nutshell, the point is that if we do not address also the consumption level, of course, like changing, uh, I mean, ju just eliminating the possibility of producing some goods like in Europe, it's not going to be enough. And also there is something we could, we could say on the deforestation regulation. On this point, just because it was uh, raised by Julia, I would actually say I also like quite a lot of the, defore the deforestation regulation. And now I'm quite sorry when I see that the European Commission is asking to postpone its entrance into force by 12 months for big uh, companies and by 18 months for medium and small enterprises. So again, final, I mean, final, really final uh, statement, I would say of course, the European Green Deal Commission, the von der Leyen Commission, did something. Also, I mean, it went towards greening the European legislative framework, but not enough. And not enough, again, is really not acceptable anymore when it comes to environmental sustainability in particular. In my view, I speak as a researcher and also I, uh, uh, I, I, I think I can speak also as a person belonging to the Gen Z, okay, to the Generation Z. This is kind of concerning for me. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, for providing that perspective. Now, Vitor, your is last word for this opening round. Good morning to all the speakers and the participants. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here on behalf of the Via Campesina Europe. I would like to stress, um, to begin with, that um, our voice is the voice representative of the small and medium farmers across Europe. So it's a, an important um, introduc introductory note because we represent obviously different interests from the big agribusiness and industrial farming. Um, that said, so um, those are the, the, the farmers that uh, have more uh, difficulties and uh, experienced uh, the most uh, injustices in between the, the CAP. And the, first of all, I would like to note that not every farmer, not every farmers are uh, in the CAP. There are a lot of farmers, uh, some of them uh, uh, small and medium because they, they struggle to get access to the CAP, but uh, even uh, big uh, farms, the big agribusiness farms that are outside the CAP, obviously they have, to, they have still to comply to, to the European legislative framework, but they are outside the, the CAP. That said, we welcomed in, in our time uh, the, the farm to fork strategy, the farm to fork strategy within the, the, the Green Deal in 2020. We believed in that time that it, it had some positive objectives 
but there are some uh, other basic questions that we pointed out uh, in that time and that um, within the years we have pointed out in other um, moments like when the sustainable food systems uh, legislative framework started to be discussed uh, and later of course uh, at least postponed um, we we pointed out to those topics when we participated in the discussion of the strategic uh, dialogues and we believe that these are basic points for any strategy that uh, wants and uh, firmly wants to uh, tackle the environmental and sustainability problems that uh, still exist and um, in some cases they are uh, even um, deepening in the European Union. And uh, the, the first question we always talk about is the, the question of the fairness of prices paid to the, to the farmers, because we believe that no transition is possible when um, farmers still uh, are still paid uh, below the cost of production, and this happens a lot, when farmers are subject to uh, the injustice in the um, food, food chain and food value chain uh, from the producer to the consumer. Uh, because, of course, um, I, I believe that farmers are um, available and uh, want to, to start this transition and uh, be part of it, but they, they need um at least there some some fairness in the in the in their incomes for uh, for being able to to do that and that's a major question that um farmers have have struggled with because we are in a context where not only the the power of big uh, commerce is increasing but also the cost of production have uh, raising have been raising sharply also in the last few years. Um, another question that is turning and is um, like um, worsening, I, we believe, is the question of access to land because land not only uh, is scarce, but is experiencing um, the, the competition of other uses in, in, and in some cases in agricultural uh, able lands to, to, to cultivate. And that's a major obstacle to generational renewal and to access to land. We strongly believe that no transition is possible uh, with, without more farmers uh, working in the, the fields, without people in the territory. This is a key, a key question for us. Um, and for that, we would like also to see other um, methods of production uh, within the frame of agroecology uh, being uh, knowledge in the, in, the, um, in the CAP and by the European institutions. And of course, the valorization of local production um, by, by instruments such as public procurement, uh, but also in returning to the question of the market regulation, which is key for, for us. Uh, uh, with uh, public stocks to in order to stabilize the agricultural markets. Um, in this context, we also uh, note um, every time that the the free the, the so-called free trade agreements can jeopardize all these efforts that in the European Union are being made to increase the sustainability of our production, because uh, as we know them uh, right now they um, are favoring the industrialization not only in, um, in, the, in the other side of the ocean, uh, thinking of the, the Mercosur Agreement, of course, but uh, also in our side. And that's uh, a way that we believe that should be reversed, the industrialization of agriculture and uh, taking another model uh, that could value and bring people to, to land and to the territories. Of course, this uh, requires also changes in the, the common agricultural policy, um, because we believe that um, in and this relates obviously to the questions of income. Um, the, the small and medium farmers are being subject to major injustices in, in the um, supports distribution. And this is a major reason, reason for them to abandon land and to and when they do that, 
um, big environmental risks arise, and uh, I think we can see that all over all over Europe. And this is not um, compensated by some increases uh, in the sustainability of agricultural policies of industrial farms. And uh, so as a final message, I think that um, the European Union has to, has to look for these small and medium farmers for, for, and for the sustainability of territories not only on environmental terms, but on, but also in the uh, in ensuring that the the economic viability of the farms and of the social the social tissue uh, there is um, well um, is, is is strengthened in order to um, to make possible the the sustainability sustainability transition that we need and we always and all of us. Uh, believe that is needed and to be and is needed is needed to be reinforced also. Thank you, thank you very much, Victor. And um, we have taken a bit longer than planned for these opening statements, but there was so much ground to cover and so much wealth in your observations on what is the status quo and what the shortcomings in the existing system are. Um, uh, Roberto has already answered a question in the chat concerning the reference to the Nature article um, that he mentioned. So uh, those who are curious about it, check the answer that Roberto provided in the chat. There is also a question in the chat concerning uh, volatility in prices of commodities and how this affects the farming sector and the agricultural sector. So. Um, my next question for you all on the basis of what has been said is, um, can the cap be fixed? The cap has many issues and you have mentioned a few with it, but what do you see happening next with the cap? Um, what do you expect the revision to do? What is your hope for the next cap? Let's start with that and maybe Gail can again go first. Thank you very much. I guess this is more a question for others to say and me being in listening mode, but I'm very happy to, to, to say a few things. I think as, as was mentioned, and by the way, this is also uh, indeed a note from the, from the Court of Auditors on the, on the current cap, is that the framework is, is there. There are a lot of potential in the, in the legal framework as it is. And maybe not all the potentials have been sized by the, the member states in implementation, although, as I said, 32% of the funding are planned uh, for, for environmental and climate actions. But this is indeed um, a point of attention um, and will continue to be. Uh, so first, clearly, the environmental and, and climate issues are there and, uh, and, we, and we know that there's more to be done uh, in certain areas, water, uh, adaptation um, and, and climate adaptation and, and mitigation that we know. So the, the issues are there, there will continue to be a certainly a very high attention to environmental and climate objectives, that is for sure. Uh, even the, 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 this, uh, you know that there was this strategic dialogue on the cap. This is also a conclusion that we read that there should continue and even be a bigger attention to this uh, environmental and climate uh, sustainability. Having said that, and also from that report and 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 from DG Agri, this is. Of, of course, uh, a concern. We have to make sure that sustainability covers the three dimensions of sustainability. And I think uh, Mr. Rodriguez also came on all these aspects. Now we speak about people, we speak about farms in the EU, mostly nuclear family farms, uh, these industrial farms, they are not so uh, widespread in the EU. We still have mostly uh, uh, family farms. The economic and social aspects have to be taken into account. So yes, we have to do to continue and to do better on the environmental and climate uh, issues. Uh, but we have to uh, always take into account that this has to go hand in hand with the economic and social sustainability. If we have no longer young farmers setting up, if uh, uh, farmers cannot no longer make a viable economic business, 
all this uh, environmental and climate sustainability and what we want to, how we want to see our landscapes or or or, um, or farmland will not happen. So it's, so they, they they really go together. Um, perhaps some uh, some more concrete uh, thoughts from my side. Um, open also the, the discussion. I think there is scope for perhaps better targeting sometimes territorially. It's true that certain um, certain measures are offered at national scale, while in truth um, they should be more targeted to certain areas, certain types of systems, certain regions where there is the particular problem to address. So that's um, that's something that that could uh, perhaps be seen. Um, I think there is also a distinction that we should make better between the maintenance of good practices. And there, I, it, it was a point raised by Alan. Sometimes we, we find practices that were already in place. This is not necessarily bad. Hold on. We have uh, very good farming systems in mountain pastures, extensive systems. They are supported to continue to do what they do and, and and they are not so competitive they need support if we drop cap support for these types of farming systems they will simply disappear so maintaining is not as such bad but we need to identify what we support for maintaining good practices good systems and what we support for a change that i think would be very important in the future to better distinguish these types of supports and the support for change probably requires a more intense funding so there's a question of level of funding there's a question of time then maybe this support could be temporary as i said also before i think uh, there could be improvements in the in the monitoring and the, and the data we use uh collectively and not just the commission the member states everyone to have better data again back to better targeting but also better measuring the results in the in the field of uh, ghg emissions and there uh, may be a uh, in, in reaction that was from uh, Roberto Talenti uh, to say where well, is nothing is happening with the with the climate uh, climate emissions there's no change agriculture is not doing enough uh, certainly agriculture needs to continue to make efforts to reduce emissions that's for sure uh, certainly not saying the country but currently we find that these data coming from inventories they are very broad brush and they don't take into account the good practices that are uh, uh, currently implemented. So this is a problem and this is very discouraging for the sector. Huh? We continue to tell to farmers, you're not doing anything, it does not work, the indicators are bad. While they, in truth, they are, they are implementing already quite some measures, so we need also a better um, monitoring of the results. Maybe we start with that. <laughs> Thank Many you. thanks. Many thanks, Gail. It's really very interesting to hear your perspective on this issue. Alan, anything you would like to add or challenge among the things that Gail said? Uh, no, I want to uh, maybe just first pick, pick up one point, which is uh, where I, I agree with Gail that uh, the new cap with the new delivery model has lots of potential. Um, and the question is, how do we encourage, incentivize uh, the member states to make use of, of that potential? Um, and we clearly are trying to move towards this results-based uh, approach, both at farm level, but also at member states. Um, for me, uh, a big issue is that um, at the moment, you know, member states are pre-allocated their cap budgets. Um, it doesn't really matter how ambitious their strategic plans might be with respect to any of the, the, the nine or ten uh, uh, specific objectives uh, we have. They're going to get the money anyway. And there are these suggestions coming from um, uh, the Berlimont that perhaps uh, the next von der Leyen Commission will have uh, a new approach to the budgeting. Um, uh, and how that would work, of course, is, is still very unclear. Um, but she seems to be trying to propose a, a, a more results-based uh, approach that uh, member states will have to achieve certain milestones in order to get access to funding. Now, how that would, would work uh, in terms of agricultural support, I, I'm not sure I can see that. But um, I, I do think this is the right way to think. We do need to provide greater incentives to member states to make better use of the, the money that 
that they receive. Um, on the other uh, issues, I, th I think it is important to, to um, relate to the recommendations from the Strategic Dialogue Report. And, and uh, just to, to, to mention uh, three that I think um, struck me. The first is, of course, uh, that they, they do recommend greater targeting of, of income support. Um, I understand completely um, Vitor's concerns and so on about structural change. Uh, to me, um, uh, this is probably inevitable um, and in fact, in many cases, desirable because um, uh, we do need um, uh, we do need to uh, to to move people, uh, if you like, to to areas where they're they are more productive in our economies. Um, Europe is facing uh, increasing shortages of labor, um, and I think uh, there, there will be an increasing question mark over uh, paying significant sums, uh, you know, to maintain people in relatively low productivity uh, occupations. So structural change is something I think that um, is probably going to continue, but uh, it, it certainly makes sense to to to, uh, to take you know to use the resources that we're now paying to these large holdings that. Uh, perhaps don't need support uh, that, that, that's what could that can certainly be used more effectively um the other a second interesting thing in the strategic dialogue which it'd be interesting to get people's comments on is that they do recommend a strong separation between the socioeconomic um objectives of the cap uh, primarily income support and the environmental objectives uh, and in fact as i read the report uh, they are recommending that we effectively do away with conditionality in total um uh, uh, that, 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 that has become too complex uh, they argue um and that effectively uh, we should take the uh, the, le the existing legislation as the baseline uh, um and anything beyond that uh, we, that we ask farmers to do they should it should be on a voluntary basis and it should be uh, remunerated. Um, we also see that philosophy in the nature restoration law. Uh, the, the, the targets all apply at the member state level. Um, any action by farmers uh, is entirely voluntary. Um, now, whether this voluntary volunt voluntarist approach is going to give us the the scale of the, the change that we need is, is for me, an open question. Um, will the budget be there to incentivize these changes? Um, but uh, at least that's the proposal from the strategic dialogue. And the third point, just very briefly, is, is uh, this interesting uh, proposal for benchmarking, which is not spelled out, but uh, it is included in von der Leyen's mission letter to the new um, uh, commissioner for, 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 for agriculture and food. Um, uh, and whether it will mean, for example, that uh, individual holdings will will be classified according to their levels of uh, sustainability. And Roberto has already highlighted how difficult it will be to get any agreement on on what we mean by that, um, uh, and whether that would mean, for example, that uh, uh, in in public procurement or even uh, mandating um, uh, supermarkets and retail um, uh, players that, that they should purchase a minimum. Uh, amount of their supplies from, if you like, uh, you know, uh, bright green uh, farms, in other words, those that are considered to be the most uh, sustainable. So exactly how that's going to play out, uh, I think, will be will be very interesting. But those are some of the changes that I think will be discussed uh, in the coming months as the new commission takes place. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Alan. Roberto. Thank you for giving me the floor again. Uh, okay, I will start again, like by um, what has been said uh, so far. Uh, just just to respond, like to answer really, really uh, quickly to uh, Gael Marion. I, I want to say, like, I didn't say that the new cup that doesn't do anything. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying, and like, yeah, no, just because uh, you said that I, I said that it, that it doesn't do anything, but I know that it does something. Again, like my point is again on the enough, where do we put the sufficiency threshold in order to give a positive evaluation in my view? So if I have to think about my dream cup, let's say like a, a, a common agricultural policy that I would like to see is first of all, a common agricultural policy that eliminates uh, all those measures, which I would say go really against environmental sustainability, because there is something in my view that still goes really just in the opposite direction. 
And I have to say, uh, personally, in my research, I focus a lot on the livestock sector. And uh, there are many concerns that I have related to the livestock sector and the way in which it is treated in the, uh, in the COP 2327. First of all, we, sh we could address the issue of subsidizing the production of animal food and also the advertisement for uh, animal food. Because, I mean, in the, the promotion program, the promotional program of the Common Agricultural Policy, I would say really unfortunately, in the year 2023, gave, uh, if I'm not wrong, some 50 million euros to the promotion of animal food. 50 million uh, after, uh, out of 80 or 88, something like that, but still more than half of the promotional funds of the European like uh, Common Agricultural Policy were given to uh, incentivize the consumption, the desire for animal food, which we know being unsustainable, if we want to talk still by, about sustainability, but from an environmental and healthcare point of view, because we know that Europeans consume too much proteins, too many proteins, and in particular too much proteins coming from animal food. And this is something that is acknowledged like by many scientists, by many research, uh, and in particular also in the report of the uh, strategic dialogue on the future of European agriculture, it's really well acknowledged. So giving all those money to the advertisement for animal food doesn't seem going in the right direction. Just to give you a number, I mean, is the uh, farm to fork strategy itself to recognize that in Europe, 68% of agricultural land is given to animal food production, which just contributes to some 30% of uh, European calories intake. So it, it just doesn't seem that doesn't seem reasonable. And we could also talk about couple payments in the cup, because if we go to regulation 2115, article 20, uh, 33, we see that still couple payments exist in the last cup. And there are some animal food products which can be addressed for couple payments. And here I have to put another study, which was uh, recently published on the European Journal of Risk Regulation by a colleague of mine, Enrico Mezzacapo. By analyzing the CAP strategic plan, basically the plans which were, were sent to the Commission, basically the study observed that 70% of the couple payments have been devoted to the sponsorship of animal food production, which again is the less sustainable way of producing food, producing calories, producing uh, proteins in Europe. So I'm really concerned about that. I would start just by eliminating these negative uh, elements of the cup in order to make the cup more sustainable. And then hopefully I would also try to introduce some new positive elements. Um, for instance, integration of the European Green Deal objectives and of the cl European climate law objectives within cup strategic, um, uh, cup specific uh, objectives. That could be a really interesting start. It is something that again is also suggested by the European Court of Auditors. They're like, okay, the new European Common Agricultural Policy should uh, actually introduce, basically integrate the European Green Deal targets within the cup. There would be something really going, I would say, in the right direction, as, at least when it comes to environmental sustainability. I, I, I could say many, many other things, but also just to talk about social sustainability, just to uh, quickly touch upon it and then uh, I, I quit, uh, or just for the moment. Uh, something that I really like, for instance, from the uh, CAP strategic, no, not the CAP, sorry, the the, um, uh, the strategic dialogue on the future of European agriculture is the idea of eliminating the area-based uh, payments, for instance, in the allocation of uh, uh, the funds coming from the European Agricultural and Guarantee Fund. We know that this fund, out of the two pillars of the Common Agricultural Policy, allocates 290 billion of euros, and it uses a lot the criterion of uh, area-based payments. And actually proceeding like this in uh, a Europe in which small farmers actually own a really small percentage of total agricultural land, while 4% of European farmers or own more than 50% of total European agricultural land actually creates a lot of inequalities, let's say, that we cannot accept uh, for social sustainability. And for the moment, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, I skipped Julia. My apologies to Julia. Roberto is next on my screen, next to Alan. That's why I got off track. Julia, the floor is yours now. Uh, no problem. I will take from the last point that Roberto mentioned then on social sustainability and um, also because it was mentioned by, by Gail at the, be at the beginning. So we think that one, uh, actually one of the main elements from the strategic dialogue that should really be taken in consideration, then we know that it should be taken in consideration as a package. Um, 
So I just uh, want to highlight this and is the fact that uh, we really need to phase out from uh, actor based payment because um, it's one of um, the main elements of the common agricultural policy that actually hamper social sustainability and uh, creates a deep um, unfairness between the farmers. As was mentioned before um, by Roberto, um, it, it creates a, an unfair distribution between um, uh, small farmers uh, that receive in a really uh, low percentage of um, uh, of, of the first pillar um, and actually it's also a, a big problem for um, generational renew um, because it's it increased uh, hampered um, uh, the possibility of new entrants to access land and um, because it increased um, the the price of land so it's it not only creates a social um, unfairness between between farmers but also uh, hamper the 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 generational rechange that we really need um, uh, within the um, the agricultural sectors. Um, not not only because not only again for for a question of social uh, fairness, but also because we really think that um, new generation are more uh, open and 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 ready to um, to. Uh, to, to welcome the, the transition towards environmental sustainability. Uh, we really see a struggle, for example, in, in changing practices for, um, for all the farmer, and it is um, not all, uh, it's more common to have young farmers uh, to really embrace uh, the problems of, of the environment and and try to change the day practices and to to contribute better for for the environment. So I think that the generational renewal is really something that can also benefit environmental sustainability. And in order to open to new generation and to um to decrease the price of land, we need uh, we need to act on uh, hectare based payment. Um, also, actor based payment were uh, in in a certain way um, criticized by um, the last report from the OECD, um, and they really identified the actor based payment as something that um, hampered also the development of a competitive um, agricultural sector and um, that stagnate innovation. So it's uh, it's it's not only a question of environmental sustainability, but it's also a question of uh, economic sustainability and social sustainability for, for the sector. I know it's, it's a big change to embrace, but as Alan referred before, there's already some instrument within the current uh, delivery model, the flexibility, that actually member states didn't use, except for, I think, Germany and the Netherlands. Um, and we really, tr um, we really should try to find a way to um, to push for more performance for member states, as was stated before, to to really implement the um, the good elements that are in in the current uh, delivery model. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. I invite all the speakers to take a look at the chat because there's a lot of questions coming up, but I give the floor to Vitor and then I will summarize the questions and pose them to you. Thank you, Vitor, for waiting. Okay, I will address the, the question of the, the next CAP uh, directly, what we uh, wanted to, um, to be there. Um, we, we believe that the key question, as I said earlier, that is uh, market regulation and this imply uh, putting in place instruments like sponsoring uh, local production and um, favoring it um, for as well for um, through public procurement, for example, but also by establishing public strong public stocks, um, a strong public stocks policy in order to stabilize um, the the, the supply and also the, the prices by to, to, to the farmers. In this line of thought, line of thought, we also believe that it's essential to uh, prohibit, as some member states already uh, do, um, to um, pay for pay to farmers um, below the costs of production, and this would imply at least a revision of the unfair um, unfair trade practices uh, directive. But we would um, accept another instrument that uh, goes to this uh, objective outside the UTP directive. 
Um, we we still believe that the question, of course, the question of payment per actor uh, introduces uh, many of the injustices of the the CAP. But uh, I think I think that there are two instruments that should be generalized and uh, compulsory uh, all the time, which are uh, capping and modulation uh, within the, um, the member states' uh, strategic uh, plans. Um, we, we agree with the question of um, targeting the CAP to the areas and to the, the systems that need, need them the most. And, and some of them are um, traditional animal systems, uh, for example, in mountainous areas that uh, have uh, no alternative and that have created some uh, strong ecosystems that rely on that animal production heavily. Um, as we here in Portugal have seen um, horrifically with the, the, the wildfires, what represents the removal of those um, systems. Uh, we also believe that is necessary a strong uh, training system for uh, farmers, um, also uh, adapting the, the production to the carrying capacity of the territories, and this is uh, obviously um more more necessary um, when it comes to the animal production because the, the great problem of animal production is the intensive uh, animal production and not the extensive animal production um, but there is uh, a question that is like an elephant in the room that is the budgetary question because um we hear a lot um, about the, the, the need and uh, to, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but to um, uh, reinstate another, um, another CAP budget. Um, and some people tell us uh, that this has to do also with uh, the enlargement of the European Union. And we, we believe that this, um, this kind of policies that um, put more demands on farmers in order to um, reach some environmental objectives that are of um, big importance um, and we, we strongly need to, to address um, is not compatible with um, you know, reducing uh, uh, budgets for the for the CAP, um, even if it is more targeted or more um, or more fair or, or fair, I don't know. But um, we have these concerns about uh, the budget of the the, the the CAP and of the European um pol architecture of policies uh directed to farmers not only to produce but also to uh, generate public services as environmental ones and so this is a big uh, preoccupation for us uh, right now and we want that the next cap has a um, has a sufficient level of uh, money to address these objectives and to allow for uh, people to uh, be on land producing and um, be available and uh, capable of reaching those objectives. Thank you, Vitor. Uh, as I promised, um, I have looked at the questions on the chat and I will summarize them in a line. And I don't expect you all to answer all questions, but I leave you to pick and choose what you would like to address. We have questions on prices volatility and what can the EU do about this? We have questions on supporting capacity building in farmers in order to make agri-food production more sustainable. We have a question on degrowth and how does the EU deal with this difficult challenge of degrowth? Um, we have questions on how can we better incentivize agroecology in the EU? We have a question on how do we monitor the pursuit of objectives like the reduction of food waste or increased animal welfare? What are the indicators that we can use to assess the achievement of objectives such as this? Finally, um, 
the role of digital technologies in improving sustainability. How can we use digital technologies to do better? So simple, easy questions. Um, we only have about 20 minutes left. So I will say about three minutes each. Pick whatever you like. I'll start with Gail. Thank you very much. I, I took good note. Maybe um, very, um, very short reactions also to what was said before. All very interesting points. So thank you very much, by the way, for this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, the, the, the points that were raised in the strategic uh, dialogue report are, of course, will be taken into account in the next cap. That's, uh, that are elements that we want to really discuss and go through. Uh, and But I want to add that also what we discuss and other things we hear and other studies and contributions will also be taken into account in the process. Uh, perhaps to say on animal production that um, it is true that every uh, livestock uh, and, and cattle in particular count negative for climate, that's for a fact, but um, there are really very uh, mixed uh, uh, pictures of, of animal uh, breedings and systems. Extensive livestock system uh, can be positive for biodiversity. We see that in mountain areas that was mentioned, some very rich ecosystems are developed with animal production. So getting rid fully, uh, it's, it's, that was not said, uh, but just to, 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 to say this, this, is, this would not be good for our environmental landscapes, etc. They also, allow to, um, uh, to, to valorize uh, some biomass that otherwise would not be available for our food anyway. So, so we have to see there's a mixed picture. Uh, coupled support is, is at least excludes totally uh, pork and poultry and, um, and the countries with the heaviest density of livestock generally don't use coupled support. It's, it's used a lot for um, uh, some for, for some uh, types of livestock that are undergoing difficulties not all are extensive that's uh, that I think is correct and I also we also know that that um, uh, they, they play they play a role uh, for for the emissions and that still needs to be addressed that's for sure but I want to pass the message that there is a mixed picture and we cannot simplify and say all animal uh, farming systems are bad by definition this would be this would be too extreme on income support i heard the uh, area based um, support to be phased out i suppose what is meant is more the income support area based because most of the environmental and climate support is also area based uh, the uh, agri agro ecological agri environmental uh, support goes through area based commitments by farmers on so many hectares i will implement that good practice so that i don't think this um, this is considered to be phased out um, and on income support, I could talk a lot as well, but I see we have uh, we don't have much time. Um, there, the history behind having it on a per hectare basis, it's related to the fact that there's, there is a low profitability of agricultural activity on a per hectare basis. It's not very profitable, so their payments kind of compensate this low profitability. There are a lot of compensations of. Yeah, redistribution mechanism that exist under the cap. Some are compulsory even for member states, but it's true that there there is still uh, the, the, it's still on a per hectare basis that the income support is provided, even if there is degressivity, even if some member states put a capping. There's still uh, the, the point of better targeting this income support certainly is is taken. I would uh, confirm totally that generational renewal will be a priority. It's, it's, uh, I think the um, average age of farmers in the EU is 57 years old. So it, 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 there needs to be, uh, we need to make this uh, job attractive for young farmers, that's for sure. Um, and the point is well taken. Supporting capacity building, I find the point extremely relevant for uh, environment and climate, uh, especially. This is not easy for farmers to, for example, change to a completely new system. Um, changing practice uh, is one thing, changing a system uh, is, is really something that takes time and needs a lot of advice because there are risks that farmers would take and they don't necessarily have all the income buffer to uh, to take this risk of changing a system. So this, this support and advisory support is, is super important. 
Um, and digital technologies, I also agree that there are lots of potential to, to, to better use their uh, precision farming is something that, that really is useful to reduce inputs, to uh, make better use of, of uh, uh, resources. And it's not the only solution. There are nature-based nature solutions, as we call them, that are also very useful. But together with more um, uh, digital technologies, with precision farming, that can really help. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Alan, your three minutes start now. Let me take the very first question from Anna. Uh, she got her question in first on, on the price volatility. And, uh, you know, I totally agree for any business, uh, you know, volatility adds to uncertainty uh, and makes life more difficult. Um, I would point out that, of course, when people uh, talk about the, the difficulties of living with volatility, they often mean not the upside of volatility, uh, but rather the downside, you know, when, when prices are falling or, or input costs are, are, are increasing. And I think it is fair to point out that we've seen a huge volatility, uh, both on input, but also on output prices. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, farm incomes have been uh, very buoyant uh, in the last two or three years. Uh, 2022 was actually the highest level of farm income uh, we've ever seen, despite the uh, huge increase in energy fertilizer prices, simply because product prices uh, actually increased uh, by uh, at least as much. Um, but having said that, uh, clearly there are mechanisms uh, available to farmers to try to 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 mitigate and and to manage uh, that volatility. One obvious one is is forward contracting. Um, I know in my own country in Ireland, for example, that uh, uh, the dairy co-ops uh, introduced a, a, an option for farmers where they could lock in a particular price, not for all of their production, uh, uh, but for a portion. And, and it was up to the farmer to decide how much they wanted to lock in. Um, the difficulty was then, of course, that dairy prices actually took off and, and a lot of farmers felt very aggrieved because uh, they had actually locked in uh, a proportion of the production to this to this lower price. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's there are swings and roundabouts when it comes to to volatility. Um, and finally, I'd simply say that in 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 my view, price volatility is difficult. But of course, it's really income volatility that can be the uh, the difficulty. And farmer farmers uh, do, do face a lot of uh, fluctuation in income from year to year. And here we do have um, the possibility of uh, various uh, income stabilization and, and mutual funds, which which are uh, uh, potentially available uh, under the cap. It's up to member states to, to introduce them in their, in their rural development programs. Um, and, you know, I, I think given that volatility is likely to become uh, even more of a problem in future, we should uh, encourage member states to, to, to make greater use of, of those uh, instruments that are already available to them. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Julia, your three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think I will take the, the following questions uh, from Joanna about the uh, capacity development, because I think um, it was touched before um, the importance of having ad uh, advisors. Um, we, uh, from our national offices, uh, we have offices in um, most of the European country and uh, some of them, they are quite active um, with farmers. And um, we try also to, to share knowledge ab about environmental practices on the ground. Um, but what we really found out is that the, there's, um, there's a big scarcity in terms of uh, public advisors and independent advisors. Um, because we think that uh, it's, it's very, very important to, um, to provide uh, advice to farmers that, um, uh, that wish to change their, their way of production. And uh, it should be independent because most of the time maybe they are related to to big companies that um, or they are quite um, conventional. They have um, un quite conventional knowledge, and uh, we really would like to have uh, more innovation and more openness from from the advisory services. So I think it's something that the CIP uh, already um, address, but uh, it should be definitely strengthened if we are looking for for a transformation on the ground and is all again I think uh, the main responsibility is also from from member states yeah thank you Julia Roberto your three minutes I guess you're gonna talk about the growth yes 
Why not? Uh, yeah, I will try to address both the questions, the points of uh, Stefano Turrini and of Clara Colonna. Uh, and I, I would start just, I, I will try to stay in the three minutes. It would be difficult, but I will do my best. Uh, I mean, I would start by a really simple observation. I mean, we live in a world, I mean, because we have to consider also kind of systemic, really global approach when we talk about food systems, I think. We live in a world in which we already produce food, enough food for feeding 10 billion people. We are 8 billion on the planet now. And according to the World Health Organization, in 2023, there were more than 2 billion people in a situation of severe or moderate food insecurity. So how can we be here now? I mean, like to this point. And uh, you may know that today is the 16th of October, is the World Food Day. And indeed, I don't know, like maybe this uh, seminar was organized today because it's the World Food Day. And when, I mean, it's the World Food Day because in 1945, this day was the, the FAO was founded. And the idea of the FAO was to indeed doing research and fight for the elimination of food insecurity. There was not the term food insecurity back then, but that was the, the, the concept already. And so, uh, in my view, why are we quite far from there, both at the global and at the European level? Because I would say the European level, the Common Agricultural Policy, Article 39 of the Treaty on the Functioning of, of the European Union, which establishes the rule for the cup, it's a reflection of this. The problem, my problem, like the problem I see, is that food is still mainly treated as a commodity. And in a world which basically respects, I would say, the capitalist rules in any sector, including the food sector, the wealth inequality of this world are reflected also in the food inequality. And this is the reason why I would say our food system are mainly unsustainable, both at the EU level and at the global level. And what we should do, basically, in my view, always a humble view, is to start considering the food system, the food sector, no longer as a place for profit of enterprises, but as the place where we realize the human right to food. So I would say we should really adopt this systemic approach and also a kind of not even consumer-based approach because humans are not consumers. I would use a human right approach when it comes to food. And I would say, unfortunately, some of the constraints of the European Union in this regard also relate indeed to the treaty of the functioning of the European Union because the common agricultural policy has a really specific mandate and increasing food productivity in Europe is actually the first objective of the common agricultural policy but I think we can go in this direction the European Union can go in this direction because of the power that it has as a I would say as a food power at, at the global level because of the environmental standards that, that we have the safety standards standards that we have and we might go in the direction through an institutional path which might see the identification of taxes, of uh, public procurement, of advertisement campaigns, etc. So there is a path we can undertake. Of course, there are going to be some political costs, there are going to be some economic costs, especially for biggest producers, but I think it's really a path that we need to undertake as soon as possible. And I'm done. Thank you, Roberto. I will abuse my privilege as chair uh, to flag to people the excellent book the Poverty of Growth, published by former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Olivier de Schutter. I'll make sure to include uh, the reference uh, in the chat so that the audience can consult this source for reference. Uh, Victor, your uh, is the last word here today. Firstly, I will take the chance to, to say that uh, I forgot the, the question of the regulation of land use uh, that uh, we as ECVC have put forward a, pr a proposal for a land directive. I would like to see it along the new CAP. I would like to talk about the question of the prices volatility because yes, it's a, it's a question of income volatility, uh, not only for producers, but also for consumers. And it's a matter of balancing the power, uh, the, the market power uh, between producers, uh, the retailers, the, the, and, the, and, and, the, and the consumers uh, as well. Um, and we, as I stated earlier, we can do this uh, through uh, instruments like uh, public stocks, public procurement, valuing uh, local markets. I think that, that are um, uh, instruments that are at hand to, to do this. I would like to um, to address the question of agroecology because it's more it's more like a knowledge system that um, in some cases it's already proved in other cases it has to be like scientifically sounded 
but I think that training and uh, the uh, incentivizing the, the community uh, spreading of this kind of knowledge and, and also um, proving that is that is uh, viable, viable and addresses uh, and adds viability to the to the to the farms uh, are ways and easy ways to to spread this knowledge and to um, have more agroecological practices in in our in our farms. And the final point to the question of digital technologies, uh, because we always address this question. Um, well, technologies should always be um, put in place to uh, facilitate our work. But we see uh, that in most, in many cases, they are being put forward to, uh, and the, the final result is that they, they bring more difficulties to farmers, uh, since, for example, they are used as uh, ways for, for example, the public services no longer have a, a humanized uh, contact with farmers. And I think that the introduction of digital technologies um, should never uh, mean that we dehumanize uh, the relationship between um, farmers and land and also between farmers and public instances and that is um, this uh, fi final message of, of mine and thank you very much for this invitation again. Thank you very much to all of you for being so uh, informative and comprehensive and honest in your answers. There was a question on whether subsidies are indeed desirable uh, and we need to move away from subsidies. And I will again abuse my privileges as chair to say a couple of words on this uh, as a professor of environmental law. Clearly, in order to achieve environmental objectives and environmental goods, we need to subsidize our way through it. It's not the only way to make it happen, but it is one of the ways. And walking away from subsidies entirely is not presently an option. But of course, uh, we need to keep our minds open to new ways of doing things, uh, given the predicaments we are faced with and the challenges we are experiencing in the use of subsidies. So thank you very much for that question as well. Now, uh, all that's left for me to say today as the chair is to thank you all for sticking around. This was such a rich debate. Thank you indeed to all of our speakers. This was a terrific debate. So thank you very much again for joining us today. And I hope we get the chance to continue this conversation further. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>